Non-Monogamy Help is a podcast where your questions about open, non-monogamous or polyamorous relationships are answered. Our host, Lola Phoenix, will consult a licensed therapist with over a decade of experience to address your problems. Names and locations have been changed or censored to keep your questions anonymous. You're listening to Non-Monogamy Help, the podcast. And welcome to episode 45 of the Non-Monogamy Help podcast. I'm Lola Phoenix. Please send your questions to nonmonogamyhelp at gmail.com and they'll either be read in the podcast or the column anonymously. If you want to read the columns and listen to podcasts, you can go to nonmonogamyhelp.com. You can subscribe to our newsletter by going to go.nonmonogamyhelp.com forward slash email. And you can follow us on Twitter at nonmonogamyhelp. If you want to support the columns and the podcast, please consider becoming a patron. Even $1 a month helps support the daily running of the columns and the podcasts, and it just shows a general vote of support. You can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash Lola Phoenix. If you donate $5 or more a month, your name with your permission will be read at the end of the podcast. Let's get to this week's discussion question. If this is the first time you're tuning in with us, every week before I read the letter, I put forth a discussion question so that you can use uh, that you can use with your friends, partners, or anyone else to get to know them a little bit more. I also answer it myself briefly just to give you a little bit of context. This week's discussion question is, what do you blame your parents for? So this is like a big can of worms to open with a lot of people, but I think it's a really interesting question because I would just want to see what people would say first off. If you were going to ask me that, I would say that I have a weird relationship with the word blame because the way that I've confronted my parents at times for things that they've done, usually they're, they say that I'm blaming for them for um, some of the problems that happen in my life when it's a bit more nuanced than that. So I probably wouldn't say that I blame them specifically for all of the things that happen and happened in my life but i would say i hold them accountable for some of the choices that they made which either made things worse or directly made things bad because i just don't have a great relationship with that word i feel like saying what do you blame them for has a specific connotation that i don't particularly like so yeah that's my answer to that big kind of can of worms question but still would be an interesting one if you wanted to try it again i'll repeat it the discussion question for this week is what do you blame your parents for now let's get to this week's letter i'm wondering if you have any advice or experience with this my partner does sex work and it causes me a lot of anxiety they were doing it prior to us getting it getting together and have been great in talking to me about it and trying to assuage my anxiety and looking for resources online everything i can find deals with either polyamory or non-monogamy where both parties are exploring with other people i found a few things speaking about situations where one partner is non-monogamous and the other is monogamous but my situation doesn't really fit any of these Before I get to my response to this week's letter, I'd like to make one little plug for something that supports the podcast. A lot of my advice involves encouraging people to seek therapy, which can be really hard. You might have a lack of therapists in your area, or maybe you've tried all the therapists you can locally and nothing has worked out, or you're like me and physically going to an office takes a toll on you. If that's the case, check out BetterHelp. With BetterHelp, you can find a polyamory-friendly therapist and chat to them online about any issues that you currently have. BetterHelp does offer some financial support options as well if traditional therapy isn't affordable for you. And if you want to try and support the podcast, you can go to betterhelp.com forward slash non-monogamy help with no hyphens and get 10% off your first month. Now let's get to my response to this week's letter. So first and foremost, I will fully, fully admit at this point that I haven't dated a sex worker, so I won't know exactly the kind of things that you might be feeling. However, I think that what might be helpful is for you to talk about what causes you anxiety about this because there's lots of different things that could be causing you anxiety and some things you can look into with regards to let's say you have anxieties about STI fears or things like that you can actually do more research about STIs you can talk to your partner about the barrier methods that they use with clients you can you know research a bit about sexual health because there's actually a study that they did recently that shows that sex workers and I don't think they use that term unfortunately have 
uh, well, in that study, they found that the sex worker group they studied versus the swinger group they studied, the sex workers had a lower STI rate. That isn't to say that having an STI is a shameful thing, and that's kind of what I feel is kind of implied by that study. But still, if, if STI fears are your worry, then you can do more research about STIs. You could also consider the fact that STI risk is always there whether or not you're dating a sex worker or not. So I do think sometimes that's kind of like the first thing people jump to if they were thinking about dating a sex worker. So that might be something to challenge within your brain. Like, you know, you have no idea if you meet someone, you know, unless you personally take a sexual history of every single person you sleep with, you don't necessarily know how many people that they've slept with. And I don't know how many clients your partner has. So y literally, like, it could be the same level of risk but you don't think that it's it's the same level because your brain has said oh a sex worker is inherently going to have a lot more risk when actually a lot of sex workers do are, are very responsible about their sexual health and some people who aren't sex workers aren't so there's there's a lot to unpack there about STI shame about you know sex work shame that could be going on in that anxiety or maybe you are having anxiety because you come from a, a more traditional conservative religious background and the idea of sex work has always been really, you know, you've sort of been taught to be ashamed of it. And so you're kind of worried about that. I mean, I kind of assume if you use the word sex work that you are more aware than most people might be, but you still might have that kind of causing that anxiety. You could also feel a very understandable concern where, you know, if you have a partner that is in a job that, you know, any job, it doesn't have to just be sex work, you could have a partner who, I think one of the most dangerous professions in, in America at least is like working at a gas station or working at an oil rig. You know, I think you can ask yourself, you know, obviously there are very specific dangers with sex work that aren't involved in working on an oil rig. But there's lots of dangerous jobs, but you might be worried about your partner's safety and that's understandable, but that's also something, you know, to talk about your part to talk with your partner about. It's it's not really clear what kind of sex work your partner does. Maybe they can talk to you about what's involved. I also think you kind of you don't want to put all the burden on your partner as well to like make you feel better about their profession because it's not really fair on them. So I think that having some basic conversations so that you just understand a little bit more about, about their work might be good for you to kind of take away and, and deal with on your own. But it just, it really depends on what's causing your anxiety. In terms of resources, I think that you need to find a um, sex worker rights group in your area and you should do volunteer work and contribute to that to that organization in order to make sure that throughout that process you will understand more about sex work and the different sort of challenges that sex workers have in your local area because it really depends on your location. Are you living in an area, you know, where, you know, being a client is criminalized? Are you living in an area where the entire process is criminalized? Are you living in an area where street work is criminalized? But doing it at home isn't but then doing it at home with other sex workers is like it's very complicated and it'll be very dependent upon the area that you're in if you were where I am in the UK then I would tell you to check out Swarm so people who are in the UK can check out Swarm I think that even if you're not in the UK Swarm has some really great resources so it's swarmcollective.org they've got a whole resources section specifically they have a zine called Ho Lover about dating and friending sex workers just to know on the word ho it's not something that other people who aren't sex workers should call other people even though it's kind of some people do use it colloquially that's considered a specific word for sex workers but this zine is about how to be a friend and partner to sex workers and it says many of us carry internalized biases and horophobia and we can bring those these into our relationships this zine helps us unpack that baggage and create considerate and caring environments for those we love who do sex work i'm only familiar with some of this stuff because i have tried to unpack my own biases but it's hard for me to be able to tell you whether or not your anxieties come from those biases they come from concern about your partner in general or from a combination of all of those. But I think that really sex worker activist groups are the best places to find resources about sex work in general. They, your specific local sex work 
activist group may not have something like this, where it's a zine specifically for people who are dating and friending sex workers, but they could have just resources about sex work and the local things that are challenges. And I think in general, if you if you care, then you should just care about it in general. And you should try and be more as educated as you can be as possible about what's going on around you and what kind of barriers that your partner might be facing and what kind of situations you know that that you might be able to help with just understanding it in general will be better for you i think it's really important i kind of want to re-emphasize not fully relying on your partner to kind of get rid of this anxiety it doesn't sound like you're doing that but i do think sometimes like having some of these discussions can turn into a little bit of a therapy session for you and it's just it is really important that you know you can ask questions about stuff and and see what they are comfortable telling you and and ask questions about you know barrier methods if you want or how or ask what barriers you'll they'll be using with you or things like that but it's just really important that you do the work to understand what sex workers go through in general as well as the specific things in your local area that they will be faced with so that you can just have a better all-around understanding of the issue that's kind of my best advice this is kind of short because i'm not a sex worker and i haven't dated sex workers so i don't necessarily I've, I've been involved in some amounts of sex worker activism and in general i'm quite a sex worker positive person and i believe that in full decriminalization and i believe that sex work is work and sex workers should be respected and not treated the way that society treats them but i'm i can't speak with any education about it and i if i've fucked up in this episode in any way and and anyone wants to tweet at me or tell me or send me a message to my me help and say oh this thing you said was horophobic this thing you said was wrong please please do because i will write a follow-up episode i will release something else because i'm not necessarily knowledgeable about this whole thing but i do want to use this chance for people who listen to me to understand that those resources out are out there and that if they even if they're not dating a sex worker and they're just interested in seeing a sex worker please care about <laughs> these issues and and locally reach out to those organizations and if you can't give time donate to them and 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 do your part to help out in this situation as much as you can help out so yeah that's my advice for this specific situation. I hope it helps. Try and find a local organization that can help educate you about this. Take charge of that. Don't put the whole burden on your partner to educate you. Have some conversations with your partner about stuff that concerns you, but be very, very wary of, of trying to make them be forced into position to reassure you, especially like if you think about it and you think, because we're kind of socialized to believe that sex work is like, <sighs> people don't make it as a job like any other job you know there are dangers to a lot of jobs and some of those anxieties may be coming from that and if you think oh would I be sitting down and having this conversation if my partner had a different job you know you might you might like you know if I had a partner who worked late nights in a petrol station I would be a little bit worried about their safety I'm also kind of generally paranoid about things but just try and kind of self-examine that a little bit and just make sure that you're not basically just assuming what their job is like when you don't necessarily know. Do you know what I mean? All right, I'm blathering now. I hope that helps and good luck. Thank you for listening to episode 45 of Non-Monogamy Help. If you want to be awesome, you can donate to the Patreon. Donating $5 or more means that your name with your permission will be read at the end of the podcast. This week's current patrons are... Laura Boylan, Chris Alvary Jones, Juke Kia, and James Wartell. If for whatever reason you can't become a patron because life happens, you can take five minutes to log into iTunes instead and find the podcast, rate, and review it. That would be really, really great. It's helpful. It gets the podcast out there for new people. If you don't want to write a review, that's totally cool. You can just do a rating. That's really appreciated. So yeah, if you have five minutes to spare, please do that if you can. So that's all for this week. You'll get a new column next Friday and another podcast episode in a fortnight. Thank you again for listening. You've been listening to Non-Monogamy Help. Our podcast music has been provided by Chris Albury Jones at albury-jones.com. And the art was made by Dom Jung at d-o-m-d-u-o-n-g.com. Thank you for listening. <laughs>